This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 30 In one of my strolls with Cory Cory, in passing along the border of a thick growth of bushes, my attention was arrested by a singular noise. On entering the thicket, I witnessed for the first time the operation of tattooing as performed by these islanders. I beheld a man extended flat upon his back on the ground, and despite the forced composure of his countenance, it was evident that he was suffering agony. His tormentor bent over him, working away for all the world like a stone cutter with mallet and chisel. In one hand he held a short, slender stick, pointed with a shark's tooth, on the upright end of which he tapped with a small hammer-like piece of wood, thus puncturing the skin, and charging it with the coloring matter in which the instrument was dipped. A coconut shell containing this fluid was placed upon the ground. It is prepared by mixing with a vegetable juice the ashes of the armor, or candle nut, always preserved for the purpose. Beside the savage, and spread out upon a piece of soiled tapa, were a great number of curious black-looking little implements of bone and wood, used in the various divisions of his art. A few terminated in a single fine point, and, like very delicate pencils, were employed in giving the finishing touches, or in operating upon the more sensitive portions of the body, as was the case in the present instance. Others presented several points distributed in a line, somewhat resembling the teeth of a saw. These were employed in the coarser parts of the work, and particularly in pricking in straight marks. Some presented their points disposed in small figures, and being placed upon the body, were, by a single blow of the hammer, made to leave their indelible impression. I observed a few, the handles of which were mysteriously curved, as if intended to be introduced into the orifice of the ear, with a view, perhaps, of beating the tattoo upon the tympanum. Altogether, the sight of these strange instruments recalled to mind that display of cruel-looking mother-of-pearl-handled things which one sees in their velvet-lined cases at the elbow of a dentist. The artist was not at this time engaged on an original sketch, his subject being a venerable savage, whose tattooing had become somewhat faded with age and needed a few repairs, and accordingly he was merely employed in touching up the works of some of the old masters of the Taipei school as delineated upon the human canvas before him. The parts operated upon were the eyelids, where a longitudinal streak, like the one which adorned Kori Kori, crossed the countenance of the victim. In spite of all the efforts of the poor old man, sundry twitchings and screwings of the muscles of the face denoted the exquisite sensibility of these shutters to the windows of his soul, which he was now having repainted. But the artist, with a heart as callous as that of an army surgeon, continued his performance, enlivening his labors with a wild chant, tapping away the while as merrily as a woodpecker. So deeply engaged was he in his work that he had not observed our approach, until, after having enjoyed an unmolested view of the operation, I chose to attract his attention. As soon as he perceived me, supposing that I sought him in his professional capacity, he seized hold of me in a paroxysm of delight, and was all eagerness to begin the work. When, however, I gave him to understand that he had altogether mistaken my views, nothing could exceed his grief and disappointment. But, recovering from this, he seemed determined not to credit my assertion, and grasping his implements, he flourished them about, in fearful vicinity to my face, going through an imaginary performance of his art and every moment bursting into some admiring exclamation at the beauty of his designs. Horrified at the bare thought of being rendered hideous for life if the wretch were to execute his purpose upon me, I struggled to get away from him, while Cory Cory, turning traitor, stood by, and besought me to comply with the outrageous request. On my reiterated refusals, the excited artist got half beside himself, and was overwhelmed with sorrow at losing so noble an opportunity of distinguishing himself in his profession. The idea of engrafting his tattooing upon my white skin filled him with all a painter's enthusiasm. Again and again he gazed into my countenance, and every fresh glimpse seemed to add to the vehemence of his ambition. 
not knowing to what extremities he might proceed, and shuddering at the ruin he might inflict upon my figurehead, I now endeavored to draw off his attention from it, and holding out my arm in a fit of desperation, signed to him to commence operations. But he rejected the compromise indignantly, and still continued his attack on my face, as though nothing short of that would satisfy him. When his forefinger swept across my features, in laying out the borders of those parallel bands which were to encircle my countenance, the flesh fairly crawled upon my bones. At last, half wild with terror and indignation, I succeeded in breaking away from the three savages, and fled towards old Marheo's house, pursued by the indomitable artist, who ran after me, implements in hand. Cory Cory, however, at last interfered, and drew him off from the chase. This incident opened my eyes to a new danger, and I now felt convinced that in some luckless hour I should be disfigured in such a manner as never more to have the face to return to my countrymen, even should an opportunity offer. These apprehensions were greatly increased by the desire which King Mahavi and several of the inferior chiefs now manifested that I should be tattooed. The pleasure of the king was first signified to me some three days after my casual encounter with Karki the artist. Heavens! What imprecations I showered upon that Karki! Doubtless he had plotted a conspiracy against me and my countenance, and would never rest until his diabolical purpose was accomplished. Several times I met him in various parts of the valley, and invariably, whenever he descried me, he came running after me with his mallet and chisel, flourishing them about my face as if he longed to begin. What an object he would have made of me! When the king first expressed his wish to me, I made known to him my utter abhorrence of the measure, and worked myself into such a state of excitement that he absolutely stared at me in amazement. It evidently surpassed his majesty's comprehension how any sober-minded and sensible individual could entertain the least possible objection to so beautifying an operation. Soon afterwards he repeated his suggestion, and meeting with a like repulse, showed some symptoms of displeasure at my obduracy. On his a third time renewing his request, I plainly perceived that something must be done, or my visage was ruined forever. I therefore screwed up my courage to the sticking point, and declared my willingness to have both arms tattooed from just above the wrist to the shoulder. His majesty was greatly pleased at the proposition, and I was congratulating myself with having thus compromised the matter, when he intimated that as a thing, of course, my face was first to undergo the operation. I was fairly driven to despair. Nothing but the utter ruin of my face divine, as the poets call it, would, I perceived, satisfy the inexorable Mahavi and his chiefs, or rather, that infernal Karki, for he was at the bottom of it all. The only consolation afforded me was a choice of patterns. I was at perfect liberty to have my face spanned by three horizontal bars, after the fashion of my serving man's, or to have as many oblique stripes slanting across it, or if, like a true courtier, I chose to model my style on that of royalty, I might wear a sort of Freemason badge upon my countenance in the shape of a mystic triangle. However, I would have none of these, though the king most earnestly impressed upon my mind that my choice was wholly unrestricted. At last, seeing my unconquerable repugnance, he ceased to importune me. But not so some other of the savages. Hardly a day passed, but I was subjected to their annoying requests, until at last my existence became a burden to me. The pleasures I had previously enjoyed no longer afforded me delight, and all my former desire to escape from the valley now revived with additional force. A fact which I soon afterwards learned augmented my apprehension. The whole system of tattooing was, I found, connected with their religion, and it was evident, therefore, that they were resolved to make a convert of me. In the decoration of the chiefs, it seems to be necessary to exercise the most elaborate penciling, while some of the inferior natives looked as if they had been daubed over indiscriminately with a house painter's brush. I remember one fellow who prided himself hugely upon a great oblong patch placed high upon his back, and who always reminded me of a man with a blister of Spanish flies stuck between his shoulders. Another whom I frequently met 
had the hollow of his eyes tattooed in two regular squares, and his visual organs being remarkably brilliant, they gleamed forth from out this setting like a couple of diamonds inserted in ebony. Although convinced that tattooing was a religious observance, still the nature of the connection between it and the superstitious idolatry of the people was a point upon which I could never obtain any information. Like the still more important system of the taboo, it always appeared inexplicable to me. There is a marked similarity, almost an identity, between the religious institutions of most of the Polynesian islands, and in all exists the mysterious taboo, restricted in its uses to a greater or less extent. So strange and complex in its arrangements is this remarkable system, that I have in several cases met with individuals who, after residing for years among the islands in the Pacific, and acquiring a considerable knowledge of the language, have nevertheless been altogether unable to give any satisfactory account of its operations. Situated as I was in the Taipei Valley, I perceived every hour the effects of this all-controlling power, without in the least comprehending it. Those effects were indeed widespread and universal, pervading the most important as well as the minutest transactions of life. The savage, in short, lives in the continual observance of its dictates, which guide and control every action of his being. For several days after entering the valley, I had been saluted at least fifty times in the twenty-four hours with the talismanic word taboo shrieked in my ears at some gross violation of its provisions, of which I had unconsciously been guilty. The day after our arrival, I happened to hand some tobacco to Toby over the head of a native who sat between us. He started up, as if stung by an adder, while the whole company, manifesting an equal degree of horror, simultaneously screamed out, Taboo! I never again perpetrated a similar piece of ill manners, which indeed was forbidden by the canons of good breeding, as well as by the mandates of the taboo. But it was not always so easy to perceive wherein you had contravened the spirit of this institution. I was many times called to order, if I may use the phrase, when I could not for the life of me conjecture what particular offense I had committed. One day I was strolling through a secluded portion of the valley, and hearing the musical sound of the cloth mallet at a little distance, I turned down a path that conducted me in a few moments to a house where there were some half-dozen girls employed in making tapa. This was an operation I had frequently witnessed, and had handled the bark in all the various stages of its preparation. On the present occasion, the females were intent upon their occupation, and after looking up and talking gaily to me for a few moments, they resumed their employment. I regarded them for a while in silence, and then carelessly picking up a handful of the material that lay around, proceeded unconsciously to pick it apart. While thus engaged, I was suddenly startled by a scream, like that of a whole boarding school of young ladies just on the point of going into hysterics. Leaping up with the idea of seeing a score of Hapar warriors about to perform anew the Sabine atrocity, I found myself confronted by the company of girls, who, having dropped their work, stood before me with staring eyes, swelling bosoms, and fingers pointed in horror towards me. Thinking that some venomous reptile must be concealed in the bark which I held in my hand, I began cautiously to separate and examine it. Whilst I did so, the horrified girls redoubled their shrieks. Their wild cries and frightened motions actually alarmed me, and throwing down the tapa, I was about to rush from the house, when in the same instant their clamors ceased, and one of them seizing me by the arm, pointed to the broken fibers that had just fallen from my grasp, and screamed in my ears the fatal word, Taboo. I subsequently found out that the fabric they were engaged in making was of a peculiar kind, destined to be worn on the heads of the females, and through every stage of its manufacture was guarded by a rigorous taboo, which interdicted the whole masculine gender from even so much as touching it. Frequently in walking through the groves, I observed breadfruit and coconut trees, with a wreath of leaves twined in a peculiar fashion about their trunks. This was the mark of the taboo. The trees themselves, their fruit, and even the shadows they cast upon the ground, 
were consecrated by its presence. In the same way a pipe, which the king had bestowed upon me, was rendered sacred in the eyes of the natives, none of whom could I ever prevail upon to smoke from it. The bowl was encircled by a woven band of grass, somewhat resembling those Turks heads occasionally worked in the handles of our whipstocks. A similar badge was once braided about my wrist by the royal hand of Mahavi himself, who, as soon as he had concluded the operation, pronounced me taboo. This occurred shortly after Toby's disappearance, and were it not that from the first moment I had entered the valley the natives had treated me with uniform kindness, I should have supposed that their conduct afterwards was to be ascribed to the fact that I had received this sacred investiture. The capricious operations of the taboo is not its least remarkable feature. To enumerate them all would be impossible. Black hogs, infants to a certain age, women in an interesting situation, young men while the operation of tattooing their faces is going on, and certain parts of the valley during the continuance of a shower are alike fenced about by the operation of the taboo. I witnessed a striking instance of its effects in the Bay of Tior, my visit to which place has been alluded to in a former part of this narrative. On that occasion, our worthy captain formed one of the party. He was a most insatiable sportsman. Outward bound, and off the pitch of Cape Horn, he used to sit on the taffrail and keep the steward loading three or four old fowling pieces, with which he would bring down albatrosses, cape pigeons, jays, petrels, and diverse other marine fowl, who followed chattering in our wake. The sailors were struck aghast at his impiety, and one and all attributed our forty days beating about that horrid headland to his sacrilegious slaughter of these inoffensive birds. At Tior he evinced the same disregard for the religious prejudices of the islanders, as he had previously shown for the superstitions of the sailors. Having heard that there were a considerable number of fowls in the valley, the progeny of some cocks and hens accidentally left there by an English vessel, and which, being strictly tabooed, flew about almost in a wild state, he determined to break through all restraints, and be the death of them. Accordingly he provided himself with a most formidable-looking gun, and announced his landing on the beach by shooting down a noble cock that was crowing what proved to be his own funeral dirge, on the limb of an adjoining tree. Taboo! shrieked the affrighted savages. Oh, hang your taboo, says the nautical sportsman. Tuck taboo to the marines, and bang went the piece again, and down came another victim. At this the natives ran scampering through the groves, horror-struck at the enormity of the act. All that afternoon the rocky sides of the valley rang with successive reports, and the superb plumage of many a beautiful fowl was ruffled by the fatal bullet. Had it not been that the French admiral, with a large party, were then in the glen, I have no doubt that the natives, although their tribe was small and dispirited, would have inflicted summary vengeance upon the man who thus outraged their most sacred institutions. As it was, they contrived to annoy him not a little. Thirsting with his exertions, the skipper directed his steps to a stream, but the savages, who had followed at a little distance, perceiving his object, rushed towards him and forced him away from its bank. His lips would have polluted it. Wearied at last, he sought to enter a house that he might rest for a while on the mats. Its inmates gathered tumultuously about the door and denied him admittance. He coaxed and blustered by turns, but in vain. The natives were neither to be intimidated nor appeased, and as a final resort he was obliged to call together his boat's crew and pull away from what he termed the most infernal place he ever stepped upon. Lucky was it for him, and for us, that we were not honored on our departure by a salute of stones from the hands of the exasperated Tiors. In this way, on the neighboring island of Ropo, were killed, but a few weeks previously, and for a nearly similar offense, the master and three of the crew of the K. I cannot determine with anything approaching to certainty what power it is that imposes the taboo. When I consider the slight disparity of condition among the islanders, the very limited and inconsiderable prerogatives of the king and chiefs, and the loose and indefinite functions of the priesthood, most of whom were hardly to be distinguished from the rest of their countrymen, 
I am wholly at a loss where to look for the authority which regulates this potent institution. It is imposed upon something today, and withdrawn tomorrow, while its operations in other cases are perpetual. Sometimes its restrictions only affect a single individual, sometimes a particular family, sometimes a whole tribe, and in a few instances they extend not merely over the various clans on a single island, but over all the inhabitants of an entire group. In illustration of this latter peculiarity, I may cite the law which forbids a female to enter a canoe, a prohibition which prevails upon all the northern Marquesas Islands. The word itself, taboo, is used in more than one signification. It is sometimes used by a parent to his child, when in the exercise of paternal authority he forbids it to perform a particular action. Anything opposed to the ordinary customs of the islanders, although not expressly prohibited, is said to be taboo. The Taipei language is one very difficult to be acquired. It bears a close resemblance to the other Polynesian dialects, all of which show a common origin. The duplication of words, as lumi lumi, poi poi, mui mui, is one of their peculiar features. But another, and a more annoying one, is the different senses in which one and the same word is employed. Its various meanings all have a certain connection, which only makes the matter more puzzling. So one brisk, lively little word is obliged, like a servant in a poor family, to perform all sorts of duties. For instance, one particular combination of syllables expresses the ideas of sleep, rest, reclining, sitting, leaning, and all other things anywise analogous thereto, the particular meaning being shown chiefly by a variety of gestures and the eloquent expression of the countenance. The intricacy of these dialects is another peculiarity. In the missionary college at Lahaina Luna, on Maui, one of the Sandwich Islands, I saw a tabular exhibition of a Hawaiian verb, conjugated through all its moods and tenses. It covered the side of a considerable apartment, and I doubt whether Sir William Jones himself would not have despaired of mastering it.